Hello everyone. What you're about to hear is a recording of our live episode on A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, with special guests Mark Patton, Robert Russler, and Kim Myers. This recording was held on September 22nd, 2019 at Fantastic Fest in Austin, Texas, as part of their Queer Horror Sidebar, which included the Texas premiere of the documentary Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, and a special drag performance by Peaches Christ. This being our first live recording, there are a few audio issues, like our intro theme playing over our actual onstage introductions, but nothing episode ruining. Anyway, this was fun, and we hope you enjoy. Loved it. I send you a copy. Bam! Bitch went down. So I am Jones. I'm Tracy. We're really weird. The horror queers, the only ones. Yeah. The queer horror is so hot right now, so it's good. Um. Yeah, so we are part of the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network, and every week we release new episodes that we look at queer horror films, we look at films that are not queer, but then we find queer readings of them, mm. and then sometimes they're just campy as shit, and we make fun of them because we're queers. It works out. Sometimes we're funny. It's going to be a real test tonight, because when we're recording, we can't hear people not laugh at our jokes. So this is going to be a little bit different. <laughs> It's true. We think we're very funny when we record in our own apartments. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but normally we do, you know, just any horror film with queer elements. Um, but again, it doesn't always have to have a queer element. Not the case with tonight's or today's film. Uh, you might say it's a little queer. But uh, to help us kind of talk about the film is the film star, Mark Patton. <laughs> this is like... Oh, I see who you're really here for. <laughs> and my boyfriend. My new boyfriend. Grady. Oh. <laughs> yes. Um, Robert Russler. Robert Russler. Yes. yes. Come on. Come on, get up here. <laughs> and Kim's going to be joining us. <laughs> I wore short shorts for this occasion. Because of him. <laughs> Showing well. a lot of leg. <laughs> yes, and we are going to be joined by Kim Meyer. She has been delayed. She is en route, so she's just going to like magically appear at some point. So make Just sure like she... she did in my life. Yeah, Aww. just magically appear. <laughs> so sweet. Oh, I love her. Yeah, she's my, she's my girl. And before we dig into it, has anyone not seen A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 before? Fuck. <laughs> Fuck me in the face. Okay. That's well, great. that is fantastic. <laughs> Boo. Okay, well, that was the first one. There's many more to come. <laughs> so, yeah, we are talking about A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge on something. There's no revenge in this film. <laughs> yeah. The uh, subtitle of the film doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> you're already like, fuck no. Excuse we me, can't is... wait to fuck you up. Really. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> you're going to be great. You've met your match already. So go this ahead. is a super uh, roast, and we didn't even know it. Yeah, we we are very uh, you know like we're a lot of fun, but we're very serious about Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, we love it. Yeah, well, I know you love it, but we like have heard all the tropes so many times that we don't play that game no more. Mm -hmm. And so we might readjust the conversation just a tiny bit. Do it if you if you guys don't mind. Uh, we have been the butt of so many jokes and been blowjob joked to fucking death, right? And that's why we made our documentary, Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, which will be showing here at Fantastic Fest. And when you see that documentary, you'll know why we don't really accept no uh, disrespect in any way. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys are joking, so it's going to be a fun time. But what, the one place we won't go with you is we won't make fun of it. Okay. okay. We'll take it. So, so you know, because actually this movie means a lot to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's a touchstone for the gay community. And I've really, you know, gone out of my way to, um, to lift the vibe on this. You know, I mean, it's like you can only be called a cocksucker online so many times and think that it's funny. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and so if we could uh, talk at it from that angle, I'd be really thrilled. If Absolutely. Okay, great. 
So let's get going. Okay. Okay. So Mark doesn't fuck around, does he? <laughs> I mean, he's, our, a, he's a bitch, boy. He's already Come called on. us on our bullshit like two minutes in. I love it. This is what you came for. It You're never changed. Great. It never changed. You know, it's going to be great. And Absolutely. it's like, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to, like, up the bar for you. You know? And it's like, so let's go. Have fun. You got all those questions? We can answer all of them. I, well, I, fuck, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can. Um, okay. Well, I guess, so, just some background information. Because I think a lot of, the thing with the film is a lot of people perceive it, maybe not you people, but the general public, public, populace, uh, perceive it to be a critical and commercial failure which it wasn't really at the time. It actually made more money than the original film. Uh, you're looking at a $30 million domestic gross, which is $5 million more than the original film, which adjusted for today is like $73.5 million. Um, that's the most like, boring statement I'll tell you today, I promise. Uh, but it's, really, it's, it's interesting how, since the film came out, mm-hmm. it has been perceived as this bomb. And it wasn't. Actually, without the success of this film, you wouldn't even have the rest of the franchise. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that one, that's one of the things that I correct. Like, uh, IndieWire just did a thing on it. And they, you know, the beautiful rave review of the uh, Scream Queen. But then they're like, well, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street was a f- commercial failure. It was a critical failure. Uh, both of which are not true. Uh, it was a financial success. It was a critical success. It got great reviews from the New York Times, the London Tribune, major, major papers. The story is more interesting if actually that we were successful because what happened to us afterwards Mm -hmm. becomes even more tragic. Um, And that has to do with, actually it has to do with Wes Craven more than it has to do with uh, almost anything. But we can talk about that as we go along. For sure. But yeah, so I want to correct people with that. That like, it wasn't... uh, and it didn't become the gay movie until much further down the road. And then you have to deconstruct what people are saying when they say bad, mm. right? Because a lot of people say it's a bad movie, and what they mean is it's a gay movie. And some people say it's a bad movie that it's not a Wes Craven movie. And somebody will just say it's a shitty movie. I think what I actually like about the film is it, it doesn't feel like a Nightmare on Elm Street film. Um, it very much feels like a possession movie that happens to have Freddy Krueger in it. And I think from the horror community in general, that's probably... I mean, obviously, y'all have more experience with the fan reception than we do. But I think also it's, you know, you have the gay film, but you also have that it's, it doesn't feel quite like a Nightmare on Elm Street film. Right, and the reason for that is... Originally, Nightmare on Elm Street came out, and I screen tested to play Glenn in the original uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. So Wes Craven didn't want this to be a franchise. He was adamant that there would be one movie, right? So Bob Shea had given away all his money to get the first one made. Mm -hmm. So he was broke, and he needed to make another movie. So they threw this one together, and, uh, and it was successful, right? The reason it doesn't fit into the series is because Wes kind of did like the most disrespectful thing you can do to an artist. He came back because he realized it was a billion dollar franchise, but what he did is he just ignored that they made the second one. He took the money that we made, made his movie with it, and went from one to three and pretended we didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's why it doesn't fit in. Of course it doesn't Mm -hmm. fit in. I mean, he made no attempt to fit it in. And it was sort of like Roman, when we're talking, he'll talk about like, uh, it's kind of a cool metaphor, right? It's like people throw it away because it's a gay movie. It's like, and that's why I said what I said at the beginning of this. We're tired of being thrown away Mm -hmm. just because it's gay. You know what I mean? That was the whole thing. Oh, it's gay. We threw it away. That's not the reason they threw it away. It's because Wes sort of just didn't want it to be. It wasn't his thing, right? And so, but he took the money, (laughs) you know? And, and so he moved on. So it's nice to correct that. I mean, still ha- it's fun. It is a standalone movie. It doesn't fit with the rest of them. But I think if you watch it tonight, it, you'll really enjoy it. But I think it's what makes it so fascinating, though, is that it, it, it is the outlier in the franchise, mm-hmm. but that's kind of what makes it refreshing to watch. Yeah, well, I think he had a great opportunity to do something really cool, which he didn't do, and it's like if I were directing it, this is mm-hmm. what I would have done, right? At the end, Jesse should have killed Lisa. Right, first of all. And she should have been disappeared because he was trying to get rid of the feminine anyway. That's what the whole thing is about. Yeah. So he, when she gave him a hug, he should have killed her. And then Fred, then Jesse and Nancy could have been the interlocutor to the real world and the dream world. And they could have joined forces to fight Freddy everywhere and sort of block him in. Uh-huh. But since there's that big hole, 
in the in the middle of the thing. Mm -hmm. It's like there's no room to like they never even talk about us again. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like we don't like I'm the only person. Me and Lisa Wilcox, I think. Yeah, are like kind of left alive and just like left out there hanging in the universe someplace. That's something with those '80s horror franchises, no, though, where like continuity. It's like they didn't really care. But we're gonna talk about the ending of the film because yeah, like I, yeah. I'm fascinated by what you wanted to happen then because uh -huh. that's yeah. But we'll okay. we'll get there. Um, so okay, do we want to go through a plot summary in case? Yeah. Of course, yeah. Joe. <laughs> Sure. That's you. That's your cue. That's my cue. Sorry. All right. I hope I didn't screw you guys all up. I'm really No. Sorry. Oh my god. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined all their jokes. I lied so terrible. We're going to keep trying to make them. <laughs> and I'll keep putting them down. So it'll all work out fine. But that's like kind of funny in and of itself. Right. So That's what comedy is. It's cringe. Yeah. But we're the butt of the cringe. But you know yeah. what? It's a nice change of pace. So that's good. This is true. Usually I get it from Trace, so. All right, so bear with me, and also feel free to interject at any point. Okay. Okay, so here's your plot summary for Nightmare on Elm Street 2. After an opening dream sequence... That's wrong. God <laughs> damn it! <laughs> he beat me. Go. Go. This is talented. Okay. If not, we'll never get through this. After an opening dream sequence in which he and two girls are driven out to the desert by a man with knives for fingers, Robert Englund, teenager Jesse Walsh, Mr. Patton. Wait, I do have something to say about this, though. Here so, we, we like to joke, because um, there's like this trope in 90s teen horror comedies that like, oh, like, you know, the main character is like this girl with glasses and a ponytail. They do this kind of with you in the opening scene of the film, where it's like they slathered your hair in grease, and then like... Yeah, they try, out. they try to make you look ugly, well, actually, which is not working, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but no, that was, Thirsty. a lot of people didn't understand that it was a dream. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. Jesse was dreaming that he was a nerd on the back of the bus. And they like went through like five or six different colors trying to bring my skin down. Because oh, really? I just had that perfect skin at the time, so they couldn't make <laughs> me look ugly. So they settled on that pea green. And, and then like people, like people will come up, it's like really funny to watch people watch the movie. They'll come up and be like, why did you were looking so ugly in the first scene? Did they decide not to make you ugly in the movie? And I'm like, no, I was, that was a dream. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I didn't but, think but about But in that. the 80s too, that wasn't ugly, that was emo. E oh yeah, but I didn't know from emo. If so. you watch that opening scene and you put Cure in the background, you can't help but groove to it. Oh, absolutely. I was thinking like if they would have told me, if David would have told me about the script, do you know what I mean? Like his subtext. I would have actually had really long hair when I got hired to do this. I wouldn't have cut it. And I would have worn all black. And I would have uh, played the Smiths music all the time. And then Jesse would be totally different. And I would have slept in the closet. So my mother could come and say, Jesse, come out of the closet. Come out of the closet. You know? <laughs> would you have slept upside down? No. Okay. <laughs> what? He's making a bat joke. Like I, oh, I, oh, I, no, I, I was making a closet did, joke, and you were making a bat joke. I didn't get that. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the nature of our podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so you verbally spar... No, not you. Sorry. Jesse verbally spars with his father, Clue Gallagher. He is doted on by his mother, Hope Lang. Gulager. Gulager. Trace loves to correct him. Joe can't read. I'm, I'm functionally illiterate. <laughs> And he drives Lisa, er, Meryl. Meryl Streep. It's really old, but y'all, seriously, she looks like fucking Meryl Streep in this movie. Come on. Well, I'm glad she's not here. I know. Okay, so she'll be here in a minute, so you can just drop that. <laughs> I'm going to drop it after that, I promise. What she doesn't know can't hurt her. Yeah. Uh, so he drives Lisa to school. And actually, okay, so this is the point where now I want to ask a question. There are... There are chalkboard messages in the kitchen uh -huh. that continually change to call Rhonda, to call Bob. Mm -hmm. Rhonda's my sister, okay. my younger sister, and she loves that part of the movie, and she'll be probably listening to this. All of those people were special people to me that were on that board. Uh, so nice. There's your okay. answer. Yeah, I, I love the little inside jokes. So. Okay, during baseball practice, Jesse and Bully Grady... Robert Rustler. That's arguable. Was I well, no, a bully? you're presented as a bully, but then it's like the next scene. You guys are like besties. best of friends. Yes. How did I'm you accepting. decide to play that? I'm <laughs> acceptant of everything and everyone. 
even this podcast. <laughs> Robert, we're going to ask you to go back to your seat. <laughs> no, you don't want me up here alone. <laughs> Oh, shit, he's the mediator. Yeah, he is the mediator. No, look, they, we set up different relationships in this thing. And, like, uh, if you look at the movie, uh, apart from... I mean, I know how you're looking at it, and it's, and it's cool, but we don't have cool answers for that. So, like, they became friends, which was exactly against what the trope would be at that time. Mm-hmm. Like, he should have beat me up, right? And, like, he says he wouldn't have pulled my pants down. Right. Yet. Uh, yet, until we were late, friends later. So th- it's a, like a new kind of relationship in horror. I mean, if he was going to be the bully, right, then he would say fuck you to me and call me a faggot in the 1980s. Yeah. What he did instead was accept me and become my friend, yeah. which is a different kind of relationship in horror. And we love it. I mean, we've loved it since the minute we met each other. And we've been very good friends. And like he says, he's been my boyfriend since the minute we met each other. His girlfriend's over there. But... Um, <laughs> But we had that kind of relationship, and it just spilled over into the film. So there was really no... I mean, we could have pretended that we were in, like, Rad or something like that and, like, done that tropey kind of stuff. But actually, what one of the things that's, that's kind of different about Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which is, like, not to blow our own horns, is the actors were just a little too good, to be honest with you. Kim is a really great actress, and, like, Robert is a really good actor because you don't... He's not who you see on screen. And I, on the other hand, am absolutely who you see on screen. I'm absolute, that's absolutely me you see up there. Because it was the first time ever in a film that I decided to drop my guard and let you really see me. So we were really playing the relationships as they were in and of ourselves. And I think that's what makes the movie stand up today. So I think you, you buy them as friends. That, that happened a lot. You know, you guys, during the audition process and through the arc of the movie, and utilizing the dynamic of our own relationship... And putting that on the screen, it, it happened right away. The very first day, the last day of shooting Weird Science was my audition for Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. And I got dropped off by Downey Jr. He, he, true story. No, I, I, it was on the IMDb trivia, and I was like, is that He true? dropped me off at my audition. He went, you know what, dude, don't let anything ever get in the way between you and your work. Because he was my mentor. He'd already been in like seven movies. Weird Science was my first movie. And I said, I got an audition for this movie. And it's really interesting, but I had some, you know, apprehensions about playing a bully in this sort of context. And I'll keep it succinct. When I got to the audition, they asked me, hey, did you read the script? And I said, yes. And they said, what did you think? And I said, well, to be perfectly honest, I I really love the, the story and the concept, and I'm a big fan of Nightmare One, but, you know... For my character, n- none of my friends really talk like this. And they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, there's, there's, there's no need for this gratuitous profanity and vulgarity if it doesn't have a sense of humor and if there isn't something in his heart behind it. And they said, well, give us an example. And I flipped through the pages and it said, are you fucking her for car fare? And I was like, are you mounting her nightly or what, bro? And they were like, hey, we like that. And then they said, give us another example. So I turned the page, and you guys will remember some of these lines. It said, fuck you, asshole. I was like, you know, Schwarzenegger's favorite line. Fuck you, asshole, right? And I said, uh, uh, dude, get off my hood. It was very 80s back then. It was very 80s. And they said, we want you to go read with that guy out there sitting on the stairs. And it was this pretty little thing right here. <laughs> and I went out there and I met Mark. We didn't even really rehearse in, 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 uh, you know, in any way that you would normally rehearse. Like, we just spoke and talked and got to know each other a little bit and traded some ideas. And that's my point is, is that I never wanted to play this as the bully. What I wanted to do is play it as the straight guy who relates to the guy that wasn't gay, but related to the guy that was vulnerable, that was transparent, that was afraid, that was sensitive. And, and, and then let our relationship, you know, f- come to fruition in that way. Yeah, because there had to be a reason that I would go to his room. Like, if he was, like, the bully and was beating me up, I wouldn't run off to him. 
Do you know what I mean? And like we think in that terms, but we were thinking in that terms constantly, but the writer wasn't, right? So we were like sort of fighting a writer who wasn't like a great writer to begin with. Was and Chaskin on set for any of was, that? He yes, was. He was. He was rewriting this as it went along. And right? uh, David Chaskin, by the way, the writer. Right. And you're. And what you have to understand is like all of those guys will say, "Well, we never knew what was happening that this was a gay movie, right?" And so they were shooting with two cameras, two crews, right? David was writing as they went along, right? Everybody was kind of freaked out because they didn't really know what they were doing, and he thought, "Oh, they're not getting my jokes. I'll make them stronger," right? And somebody said to him when I did the tongue scene, yeah. you know, they said to him, uh, do you know what you're doing to this boy? Do you understand what you're doing? And he goes, yeah, isn't it fun? But he didn't know I knew that until I found that out 10 years later. You know, and it's like that's when my resentment against him began because he knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. And yeah, he was going to punk me in public, right? And I don't get punked in public, you know, so... Um, and it really, you know, it began a, a, um, a journey for us. Like, the journey of Nightmare on Elm Street is really, really interesting, part two. Because we are all of an agreement right now that the whole reason we did this Nightmare on Elm Street 2 movie was to make the next movie, which is Screen Queen. And uh, there's something really fabulous about this movie, beyond the fact that it's whatever it is. How many of you in the audience, honest to God, men, right? Did this movie mean a lot to you when you were a teenager? You know, the they there was a whole current going on inside, and women, and the same. Do you know because people recognize themselves in these characters for real, and that doesn't really happen in '80s horror movies all a lot. You know what I mean? But we were doing our own thing. You know because we had to. It was sink or swim. We honestly, the director, Jack was. Yeah, a little in over his head with the uh, prop, uh, with the, the mechanicals, and he admitted that. You know, it's like he didn't know what he was doing. He'd never done it before. So all of a sudden, he's not really paying attention to us. We're just like kind of swimming on our own there. And that's what you get when you put actors together. They'll find the depth in the, in the material. Well, and, and to be too fair, I don't know if it's the right phrase, but like... Um, don't need to be fair. <laughs> well, I'm saying, it, it, I, I get him being, you know, so concerned with the technicalities of it, but at least on that point, though, the special effects in the film are probably some of the best in the franchise, which is saying something. Ever, yeah. Yeah. Because they're, it's all uh, pre-CGI. I mean, that's yeah. all real stuff. That's all practical. But that's the funny thing, too, about Nightmare 2. It was, you know, said to be this failure, and it was said to be sort of the black sheep of the nightmares, but it wasn't. And it, it stood on its own. I think that some of the scenes between uh, Mark and Robert were some of the darkest in the whole series. I thought he was frightening in a couple of those scenes. And, you know, it wasn't your typical, you know, uh, uh, 80s uh, art that was going on here. There was a lot more complexities going on. So people didn't know how to take it. But I've done 10 movies in the 80s like that. You know, at first, Weird Science wasn't really a big hit. But it's become this cult classic over the years because when you go back and watch it, you see things that you didn't pick up the first time. The same thing happened with Vamp. The same thing happened with Thrashing. The same thing happened with a lot of other movies that I did. But more than any of those other movies, it happened with this movie because we can still watch it today and it can strike up a whole conversation that doesn't get anywhere as deep or, or as meaningful if you watch any of the other movies. Well, and that's actually what I want to touch on, too. So you had mentioned, you know, at the time, you know, it wasn't considered the gay movie. When do you think... He said you look like Meryl Streep. (laughs) He said it. He said you look like Meryl Streep. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Myers is in the building. Kim Myers! He said it. He said it. (laughs) And like a good girlfriend, she has a present because it's my birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Myers. It's okay. It's okay. He was like, I'm not going to tell her when she gets here. Oh. I told on you, boy. That's really kind of fucked up. I love how it's all how going to trace. How could you betray me like that? Said it. Her husband knows karate and shit. May I ask a quick question? Has, 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 have we sung happy birthday yet? We have not. May we? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear mom. He's not a singer. 
Happy birthday to you. And many more. They're very, they're very protective of me, as you, you'll, you'll find out very quickly. That's why we put them in the middle. <laughs> well, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. She went to the other Alamo. She went to the Ritz. We went to the other Alamo. We were prompt, but we were at the wrong theater. <laughs> and then there's a festival going on there, and we, we called a lift ride, and then we called two lift rides, and they couldn't get whatever. She's the, the most on time of all of us. Oh, I don't so, like being you know, made. So this is a wonderful day. It's like, it's all full of surprises. Like, we're really excited. She was actually in the back the whole time. We just planned it as a big entrance. <laughs> So, okay, so we were talking about the appropriation of the film, I think, by the gay community and maybe when it happened. Like, when did the film begin to shift away from this idea of, oh, it's a failure, or oh, it's not the same as the other nightmares, and into what it is now starting what it to is become? Now? I think that that really began on and of itself, but it began very specifically with Never Sleep Again. Um, I had, I quit acting one day, and... If you look on the internet, if you look at actors' careers that are ending, there are, there are scratch marks all over them, like trying to hold on. There's none in mine. It's like I'm in the business one day and I'm gone the next. Because I literally said, I'm finished. I went into my agent's office and said, I'm done. I had been at an audition at CBS. And they asked me, there were 15 gay men in a room, and I was going to play a gay character on television. And they asked me if it would be okay with my girlfriend if I kissed people, uh, if people called me gay in public, would it bother her? And would I be able to like stand up to the scrutiny of people thinking that I was gay even though I really wasn't? And there were 15 gay men sitting around this table and we were in the middle of the AIDS crisis and I thought, I'm out of here. You know, I'm literally out of here. I'm out of this self-hating game. And I closed up shop and I left. And um, I went to Mexico eventually. And I live in Mexico. I'm married to Mr. Hector Morales over there. And um, we live in, in the Missouri of Mexico. <laughs> We don't live like Palm Beach or anything. We, I mean, we live in the farm country of Mexico, and we love it, you know, and I was very happy with my life. They hired a private detective to find me, and they did. And two days before they ended shooting, I flew to Los Angeles, and I talked about Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time in 25 years. And I had gone under the auspices that they were going to let me confront David Chaskin about him punking me for 25 years. Do you know what I mean? He trolled me for 25 years. Not once, not twice, 10 times a year, like clockwork. And uh, so, and then when the movie came out, um, and I won't get into Scream Queen too much, but when the movie came out, I was like, oh my God, I don't want this to be, and this, you'll see why I'm tender about this. This will explain a lot to you about what I said at the, at the very beginning of this. I do not want my epitaph to be a blowjob joke. Um, if you look on the internet now, after the last five or six years, you used to see Mark Patton is a faggot. He screams like a girl. He is a cocksucker. That's what people said about me, right? Jesse is a big old faggot. He sucks Freddie's dick, right? Now when you look up Mark Patton on the internet, Mark Patton is a social activist who has brought homosexuality out of the closet in the horror community. He's right made on. it safe for, hor for horror fans well, to be gay. <laughs> And my agenda was to, to do that. That's what I set out to do. I set out to, do, to make this room safe and all of these rooms safe for all of the queers and all of the weirdos and all the everybody to be safe. You know? Like, you can walk in here and you don't have to be afraid. Like, like it's still happening. Like, the movie It, right? The movie It comes out. And there's that kiss and the whole theater goes like, Ugh! you know? And every gay kid in that movie every gay man, every gay woman turns into themselves at that moment and goes, I'm not safe in this movie theater because it's dark and that's what these people really think. They really, they're really grossed out by us. You know what I mean? And it's my mission, and I'm like very tender about it, but my mission is to change that story, to rewrite it, and to make it safe for guys like you to go out and do your comedy, you know what I mean, and have fun and have no fear of retribution. You know what I mean? That, that they can say, like, oh, there, there's two typical fags, and then throw a rock at you. Mm -hmm. You know? I want that gone. And I want you to be free to be whoever you are and have fun, but I want everybody to be safe. And that's, and that's when it started to change. Because I would go to horror conventions, and I would stand up. I had a three-pronged thing, right? 
I said, the first year, if I'm going to do this, and I'm going to take people's money for signing autographs, and I'm going to, I'm going to take some from you guys in a little bit, because <laughs> that's how we pay for this stuff, you know what it's I mean? It's just honesty. Yeah, it's like, this is how we pay for the tour, buy a book, it's nasty, I wrote it, and there, we have our new album there, which is limited, 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 just for you guys. And it's all cheap, so you know you can get out for twenty bucks and have an autograph. <laughs> um, but the thing is, you know, it's like um, when we had when we started to have that conversation, you know, um, it became really profound and important. And I decided that I was going to squeeze as much out of Nightmare on Elm Street as I possibly could. So the first year I talked about bullying because everybody that goes to a horror convention has been bullied. You know, like if you're a heavy metal person or whoever you are, you've been, but until so you understand it. The second year I talked about homophobia, right? And then I talked about HIV in the third year because it was a community which I saw many straight people in who were playing around with blood. You know, they were playing with vampire stuff and they were like, oh, I'll just cut you a little bit. And those people didn't know that they could become HIV positive by doing that. So I decided they knew me as a nice person, they knew me as a healthy person, and then I told them I had AIDS. And when I did that and I put on that glove, it went around the world. I was on CNN International the next morning. And, uh, and I realized we were in a really powerful thing. So now when you go to a convention with me, there's a line of 100 people in line, and they're not there to get an autograph. They're there to tell me that their brother died of AIDS and nobody talked about it, or that their father was gay, or that they're gay, or that they're married and they're a lesbian. And it, all the other actors are like, what the fuck's going on here? Because it's like church, right? But it was the intention. You know, but we still have a lot of fun. I mean, we laugh at Nightmare on Elm Street all the time. But that's also the irony, too, of what was going on while we were filming and, and you know, the homosexual undertones and overtones and all of that stuff that was a bit controversial and, and judged. Mm -hmm. and, but w what happens as a result of that, you would have I would have never been able to plan. Because I can't tell you guys how many young men over the years in the last 30 something years have come to me in a genuine way and said, dude, you're my first crush. That movie made me feel good about who I am. And it wasn't about me at all. It was about him. But, well, it, but it was about us too. It was about the, the whole dynamic. It was about that whole responsibility that we didn't know we had. That I'm so glad. Have you ever done anything in your life and looked back and regretted and wish you would have done something differently. This is an example of one of those things that I didn't have to ever look back and go, I wish I did something differently. And it wasn't about patting myself in the back or being proud of myself, but it was about a self-gratitude. Like, I'm so glad my mom and dad raised me to be who I am. I'm so glad that I have the relationship with these two to my right that we kept during the movie and that we kept all the years, even when we separated. He was in Mexico, she was raising a family, I was doing blow. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> it was the 80s. <laughs> I, I, I was partying with Grace Jones, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey! Blame Grace Jones. Blame Grace Jones. Everybody knows about the three-way. I was really raising but you see how that, but, but you see how that works out. It's like, you know, that whole time when people are saying, putting labels and calling something good and bad, you know? You guys know that farmer joke. There's no such thing as calling good and bad. Because some of the things that you think bad turn out to be the, this fantastic attribute in, a, in someone's life. And sometimes when you think something great happens, it turns out to be a little curse in disguise. And doing this movie and, and the subject matter and everything that it entailed and all the bullshit that mostly he was dealing with on the set, it was actually, it turned around and, and it got to be this opportunity for, for us to wind up here, right here, right now, and for him to be an advocate and how he's just, I think, stepped up with such dignity and class and how over the years I've got to have a sort of a, a constant change of perception of what it is that I do for a living and how much I should be grateful for it. And, and all those guys that came up to me, every single one of them, I'm so glad to this day that I hugged them and I went, I'm so stoked to meet you, you know? Never did I go, oh, inconvenience or weird. Like, no, nah, that was fucking awesome to be able to do that. It is.
I love you for that, too. It is really true. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that the film does so exceptionally well is that if you empathize or identify with Jesse, then it becomes safe mm -hmm. to, no offense, to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. covet Grady a little bit. Oh, um, absolutely. And, and we I do. to also include Kim mm -hmm. in this. Uh, you know, Lisa, there's such a genuine affection that just leaps off the screen between your two characters. Like, you're, the first interaction, Trace and I just rewatched this watched film yesterday. yesterday morning, yeah. And we were like, the writing is so shit. Like, the... He opens the door, and you're you're completely uncertain as to whether or not Jesse and Lisa have ever met each other. But then they're in the car, and they're driving to school, and the relationship feels authentic, even though every other line of dialogue is that Jesse is new in town, and he's still finding his way. And you're like, okay, that doesn't make any sense, but these two performances feel yeah. very real. Well, again, Lisa's super popular, but like she's just hanging out with the new kid. You know, Outside of the pool party, you don't really get to see her interact with anyone else despite the fact that she seems to be like the it girl in school yeah. yeah and you know that she likes him and you know that somewhere along the line she realizes that Jesse you know isn't going to like her back the way she wants him to and the fact that she is so genuine and sweet and supportive of him I think is, it's, it's, it tells a thousand words you have to talk about that well, we <laughs> well thank you we did genuinely like each other. I, we, we, I, I mean, I can speak for myself, but you've shared this. We connected, I think, pretty immediately in a very organic way. And, you know, when, when people have asked me at various events and conventions, et cetera, um, did, I, did I know, was I aware of the, of the gay subtext and the, and the and, you know, anyway. Um, and, I, and I said no, and it was... I, sometimes I, in a way, kind of throw myself under the bus a little bit by saying I was naive, I was 19, I was, and, I, and I was definitely that as a 19-year-old. But at the same time, the way I read the story, I really loved the, love and loved this human. Je Lisa really cared, really saw Jesse. And so through that lens, she saw him as somebody Deeply loving, deeply caring, and deeply troubled and conflicted, and she didn't know all the conflicts, perhaps, but she could see that that he needed some strength and support, and so, so yeah, that that was that was very real for us, mm -hmm. on set and off. Yeah, I think it's funny because, like, if you look at the the uh, the pool scene between the two of us where the tongue comes out. Like, you gotta have the tongue, right? Which is, uh, like, the most hideous thing in the entire world. That tongue was, like, 10 inches. And, it, you know, when you go to you the... You like it. Come shut on. up. And when you go to the... Pause for laughter. There. <laughs> we got them trained, and then you're coming out of the box. It's like... No, but anyway, have you ever been to the dentist where they open your mouth and hold it open? And that's what a dental grip was in my mouth, to hold that thing in my mouth for eight hours. Mm -hmm. And I was a smoker at the time, so I really wanted a cigarette. And everybody was laughing at me. And I was walking around with this big tongue sticking out. I was out not laughing at you. And they, and they were like going like, oh my God, you have no sense of humor. And I'm like, I, my jaw is breaking, you know? And it's like, my tongue is sticking out. And, um, and you had to roll it up and put it inside your, it was all really gross. But the scene between her and I, and then, my favorite thing that Jack Shoulder ever said about me in the press was, and I'm going to diss Jack just a little bit, he was like, well, it's obvious afterwards that Mark didn't know what he was doing sexually. I should have known he was gay because he didn't know how to have sex with a girl. And I was like, with our scene. And I was like, well, Jack, Kim had in her contract that you couldn't show any part of her body. So her nipples couldn't be shown, her rear end couldn't be shown. And I had to cover all of those things up, right? So there's only one place for that tongue to go. <laughs> so no touch zone. Continue. Yes, she's so good. But I, uh, there was only one place for me to put that tongue. Grady's ass. Yeah, well, I could have. But it was on you, her... You go right over to him. It, so. it was, it it's was... the outtake you want to see, but don't get to. But it was on her stomach. You know what I mean? So it looked like I was going down on her, basically. It became very nasty looking. And, um, which is not, whatever. Um, but, but anyway, but if you see that, how that scene plays, go back and watch it. Like, if you're coming this afternoon to see, this evening to see it, watch how you play, the scene plays, if you just put into the dialogue that 
that Lisa has just realized that Jesse's gay. And she says, it's okay, we're gonna get through this together. I'm gonna walk you through this. Mm -hmm. And I had a girlfriend just like that that did that with me. And, we, and that's the scene we were playing, I think, really even though we didn't know we were playing right. the scene, mm -hmm. you know? And, but it plays beautifully, so just add that little thing in. Like, she was like, oh my God, he doesn't like girls. Oh, okay. And then she becomes his friend. You know? and, she, and that's a real hero, because she was the hero of the film. Well, I think that's a good transition, though, and then what does Freddy Krueger represent in this film? Uh, I feel like the two easiest readings are it, it's either an internalized homophobia or it is homosexuality. And uh, I was like, <laughs> did you shift? Well, you know, because Robert has his whole ideas and opinions about that, and it's mm -hmm. tough to speak for his character because R Robert's, you know, so well-spoken, and, and he has so many ideas, and... and um, it's, it's difficult, I think, for us to answer that question. Mm -hmm. I think that, that question has to be geared toward, toward Robert. I, but I don't necessarily mm -hmm. think so, because I think even as an audience member, you can read the film a certain way. There, there is the way Robert played it, but even as a viewer, intentionality doesn't always matter, per se, when reading the meaning of a film. That's right. And I will, and actually I'm going to agree with him, yeah. because I'm going to like kick the bucket down the road a little bit. If you see Scream Queen, and when you do, and some of you are going to, uh, uh, Robert was playing the homosexuality. He was seducing Jesse. He talks very clearly about it. He talks about one time rimming my mouth uh, with his glove and, and being seduced by my beauty. And he plays them as love scenes. He, but he plays it as Beauty and the Beast. And he's the beast and I'm the beauty and he wants my beauty. That's how Robert plays it. So that is homosexuality. I mean, you can... But that's a, and, and also too, because it's not about disagreeing no, yeah, or contrary. Because I well, there's no right. I way heard to Robert read a say film. that, and we did have that discussion. But it's kind of back to what we were saying and what Kim just said, and it all kind of comes together. Is a lot of these things got played out, you guys, organically during the making of the movie. So it really wasn't premeditated and pre-thought oh, yeah, out and yeah. pre-rehearsed. Like everything, sort of the relationship that you two had, the relationship that we had, and the relationship that Robert had. With Jesse's, with Mark's character Jesse, all, all those things sort of kept playing out. That's why they were there writing on the set. Mm -hmm. That's why there was so much discussion in between while we were filming. Because, uh, contrary, you know, I was very aware of the, the gay subtext right away, and I started asking questions about it right away. Not that I had a problem with it, but as an actor, you want to know who am I, what am I doing, where am I going, where have I been, what do I want and motives and, 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 and so forth. After a while, it's like, you know what? We don't need to overanalyze this. Let's just let it play out. And it was one of those things where everything was just played honestly. And I think that's why there was so much to talk about after the, the film came out. Yeah, but I think he's talking about after the fact, aren't yeah. don't you see? Um, well, and the thing is, it's like people come to the movie with their selves, and that's what's great. I mean, it's like when you're a painter, you paint a painting, you paint it on the wall, and you have to walk away, and people get to think about it whatever they want, yes. right? And like Jack is on the record with saying like this, and I had to have a conversation with him, because he was like, this is not a gay movie, this is not what I made, right? And, I'm, and I said to Jack, well, what we're talking about is not what you made. What you made is one thing, what it became is another. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're people talking about what it became. Well, right. so, like, I mean, because we, we, you know, we read the comments sometimes on our own articles. Right. You know, we, um, we did a reading of Scream, which is written by a gay man. Right. And the killers are two males, heterosexual, but you can read them as gay. Air quotes. Right. But we got so much flack for it because it's like, oh, well, Williamson has never said, Kevin Williamson, the writer of Scream, has never said they're gay. But that doesn't matter. Yeah, it, doesn't. it doesn't preclude the reading. Oh, I mean, the same thing's happening right now. I have, like, the most interesting thing going on on Facebook right at this particular moment. Do you mind if I tell? Tell us everything. Okay, tell us the dirt. Okay, well, I put up a quote about Tyler Durden, about being a snowflake, and what it, where a snowflake came from. That's it, Fight Club. Club. Yeah, okay. Fight Club. Fight Club, and it was, you know, it's a gay man talk. well, Tyler Durden is not real. Right, he's a manifestation of. Spoiler he's, alert. He's a psych. <laughs> Brad Pitt. Twenty a, years later. Right, he's a psych. It's his psychosis. But that article, that thing has been shared over fifty thousand times now, a thousand five hundred times off my page, and like the the straight guys that come on the thing are like. 
Tyler Durden, it, this is not about sex. This is not. This is about guys who go to a club and fight each other. It's oh yeah, about because masculinity. he's and it's an like, incel yeah, and they hero. Fuck each other too, but you like you don't want to. You know you don't want to <laughs> get into that part. And it was written by a gay man as a treatise on toxic heterosexuality. That's what the movie's about. But a lot of guys grab a hold to it, and I, I want to be Tyler Durden. You don't want to be Tyler Durden. If you're Tyler Durden, you're a psychopath. You know, so but it's interesting, like to watch the people get online and they say, like Tyler Durden's not gay. Like well, I had one guy go off at me so strongly about somebody made a Freddy Krueger with a rainbow sweater, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. And the guy wrote me, and he's like, "Why do you fags have to have everything? Yeah. Freddy's not gay. It's true. We're taking Robert Rustler's not gay. Why do you, why do you have to make Freddy into a faggot?" And I was like, "Dude, first of all, you know he's not real, right?" <laughs> <laughs> And second of all, you know that he's a pedophile child molester murderer. You can have him on your team if you want. We don't want but, it all, but it also goes back to, you know, we're, we're supposed to leave the audience to be able to interpret things for themselves. A- absolutely. And, and there's a lot of people that came out of that theater and didn't say that's a gay film. Yeah, yeah but that's not what we're really here to I, talk I, about. I know. <laughs> We don't no. care about them as much. But, but I mean, like, it's just, you know, if you... Straight culture... I'm um, sorry. Sorry. Uh, not, sorry to the five of you out there. Toxic straight culture. Like, yeah, if you even try to insinuate that someone, like, that someone is gay who um, a uh, straight man you. idolizes, it, they get so... It sounds so... I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> they no, sound no, so no, defensive no. about it, and it's yeah. really infuriating, because it's like, I'm not taking this away from you. Your reading is still your reading. This is still a straight character for you, or a straight man, or whatever. But, like, why can't I read this as a queer character? And Scream's maybe a little bit different, because they're, you know, murderous, psychopath killers. But any, any character. And it's just like... It, it, they're so touchy. Right. And, you know, the thing is, we're trained in this. It's like, he's trained, I'm trained, half the boys in this audience are trained to shut your mouth. Mm-hmm. The minute a straight guy goes, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what you think it is. And it's like, we're like, oh, we know what it is for us, right? And, what, and that's like, like talking about like, why we talk about this movie and the way that we talk about it. Because you know, and I know, because he travels and he listens to this. This, is a, this was a very important moment in film history for gay people. Absolutely. Right? And so if the gay people want to own it, let them have it. Mm-hmm. You've got everything else in the world take the rest of your stuff and go play with it. This is ours. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm not complaining because I got over 10 million mail letters over those last 30 years, and I was like, come see my movies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we love him, and, we, and I he know plays he gets it. But it is really weird. It's like, it's, like, it's like when you get... Like, I got my back up at the beginning of this thing. Because, and, I, and I really didn't mean to, but I knew what was coming. And you know, and, and I and I know it's all in good fun, mm-hmm. but but I'm I'm done with the good fun. Do you know what I mean? I'm tired of laughing at things that are not funny to me, and agreeing with things that I don't agree with, and I'm tired of changing my mannerisms and my clothes to make somebody else comfortable. And I don't care if that person's gay, straight, bisexual, transsexual. I will call a gay man a gay man till the day I'm died. I can't do the GLBT. I can't. You know, I'm a gay guy. I. I admit it. And I love everybody. And if you want to call yourself Charlie and your name is Charles, call yourself Charlie. I don't care. Right? Uh, Just let me be who I am, too. And then then everything will be cool. You know? But this is our property, Mm -hmm. I think. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think at the end of the day, one of the th- one of the reasons that this film has re-entered the public discussion, not just because you've made the documentary, you've got your book, all the merch, um, but I think at the that end of the day, half. one of the yeah, play, buy the merch. I think at the end of the day, one of the reasons that people love this film, like to me, whenever I mean, partially, people come out to talk to us about it because we have a podcast called Horror Queers. So well, people it, want to talk to us about it. I think it's important to see, like the, the horror genre has a very sizable queer following and it's yes. because queer people grow up as outsiders, as outcasts, yeah. hiding things and horror is a good cathartic outlet to let that out. Not, it, yeah. yeah. And well, this but, is one of those this is one of those properties where people can look at it and you know, first time viewers they look at it and they say oh it's not even subtext. It's text. Right. And that I think is proof of how far we've come but also 
it's a film that we can now champion. Like, it's a reason why people have gravitated to you. It's the reason why people come to see you at conventions. It's because they love this weird little, you know, ugly stepbrother of the Nightmare franchise because it's doing something different. You know, if you are a diehard Nightmare on Elm Street fan, you look at it and you say, it doesn't play by the same rules. You know, it's got a final boy instead of a final girl. What the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. But... I think for the queer fans in the audience, you can look at this and you can say, this is my fucking film. Like, it speaks to me. Well, you could go and see it, too. You know, we've talk, we talk about this a lot. It's like, there's a one wonderful thing in the, in the movie F Scream Queen that's really not giving anything away, but there's this one boy, and he's just really fabulous, and he's talking about why people like, why gay people like the horror movies. And it's like, we all like the final girl, right? Because she, and why the final boy doesn't work, right, on a certain level, is like she has to get kind of masculine and grab things, you know, she has, sort of has to grow a set. Yeah, it's the clover and, ki- the Right, clover and then she characters. kills, she's the Carol hero, clover. right, which girls ju- generally don't get to be. And the, the gay boy in the thing says, I love those movies, but I wanted to be her. I wanted to be the one that kicked Freddie's ass. So that's why I identified with Nancy, you know? And I think that's beautiful, you know, because we were, we, gay people are scavengers. You know, like this movie, when you get right down to it, is homophobic and hateful. You know, the love of a good woman will overcome any boy's gayness. She just loves him enough. That's actually, no, I want to touch on that thing, because you had mentioned something about the ending before, but like, Jesse is MIA right. from the climax of this film. Right. Despite the fact that he's the final boy, Lisa still saves the day. She kind of becomes the final girl, despite the fact that it's not about her. Right. So, Wes Craven. <laughs> no, it's true. They called Wes Craven. Really? He said, yeah, n- n- keep the girl. Ugh. Yeah, when they're, when they're, they were, they were filming it. Mm-hmm. And they really, he was like, you have to keep the girl alive. Right? So that's what they did because she was really supposed to die in my book, which you'll love. I, I killed, I, <laughs> Jesse, oh, smooth. Jesse killed her. And it's what he should have done. When he opened his eyes, instead of kissing her, he should have killed her. That's a horror movie, you know. Well, and I then... strongly disagree. <laughs> well, but, but that's Ooh, the thing. I mean, at the end of this movie, it, it's a. But little... I bring her back to life in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really. I kill you, and then I bring you back. <laughs> I, I, now I don't think I should have been fucking killed. <laughs> well, they needed a body count. <laughs> yeah, we had no body count. I mean, it can't just be Coach Schneider, even though, you know. Oh, we didn't really touch on the Coach Schneider. He thing, deserved I mean, to die, though, don't oh, you Oh, he deserved it. It's, yeah. Daddy deserved it. Daddy deserved it. I, people are talking to us about that all the time, and they're like, what did you think of that? And it's like, we have people who, like, that was their first view of, like, S&M or their first view of gay bar, right? But uh, I always say, like, well, he was a child rapist, and Freddie killed him. So, yeah, he, he was, was also a predator. To, yeah, he was a predator. <laughs> so uh, in our terminology today, in the 80s, they didn't think that. But if you saw that in the movie today, you'd be like, oh, my God. You know, the gym coach is going to, like, rape the boy. And, the, you know, and I figured it wasn't the first time he'd done it. I know, because he likes sweet boys. Well, he yeah. also gets a bunch of balls thrown in his face before he dies. Oh, I know. And he plays with his balls before yeah. a lot. Like the basketballs and the tennis balls. And <laughs> over the years, fans have said, you know, the first time they saw a, a naked man was either Schwarzenegger in Terminator or, or Coach Schneider in Nightmare <laughs> 2. Yeah, and Marshall I was like, Bell. man, I hope you saw Terminator first. <laughs> Choose your fighters, ladies and gentlemen. Choose your fighters. Because Marshall's ass is ugly. <laughs> he is not here to defend himself. Well, we love him. I think it, you know, it's like... It, he, oh, I love Marshall. <laughs> they love each other a lot, oh, actually. Yeah, but I don't think his ass is bad. It's fine. Yeah, it's like what it is. I think it's just the framing of it, you know? It's well, like, yeah, it's you're like, hanging on a wall, and it's, he, didn't, you know, he didn't have gravity on his side. Yeah. <laughs> gravity does kill. It does. When the longer you go, you, the more you find out gravity's a real thing. <laughs> okay, four minutes. Okay. I think we have to kind of wrap up a little bit. I'm, I'm bad at transitions, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. We're just getting started. <laughs> oh, we're sorry. Well, I guess, yeah, so we've, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I wonder if we could leave with one final question, and maybe this is a segue into mm-hmm. Scream Queens, which is airing right after this at Fantastic Fest, and you should all go and check it out. It's very good. I work at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, sorry, I took that as a compliment to me, not to the movie. <laughs> What do you think the legacy is of Nightmare on Elm Street 2? Go, Mark. 
Okay, the, uh, we changed the conversation. That's the legacy. And that's it. That's, look, like you're here. This is Fantastic Fest. This is the Academy Awards of Horror. We're sitting in here right now. You know, we're in rarefied air right here. And, um, and the fabulous people at Fantastic Fest didn't give us a 10 p.m. slot with two tickets over in the corner. We have the whole day, right? This is all Nightmare on Elm Street to right here today. And I encourage those of you who are lucky enough to get a ticket. They actually, you know, they're screening. We sold out the biggest uh, theater here. So they're screening it in two simultaneously. And then we're going to do a live Q&A for both theaters, right? That's the legacy. This is the, the movie that nobody loved. And here we are at the epicenter of horror. And it's sold out. You can't get a ticket. They're scalping them right now. And our party is the same way. And our conversation is the same way. It's, it's the liberation nightmare, I guess. And on a certain level, I think that it's Jesse's revenge. And I, I always hated the name of the movie. And I think, you know, in that movie, yeah, it's interesting with Nightmare on Elm Street. You see the first one stars Heather Langenkamp. And the next one stars Mark Patton with Robert England. And the next one stars Robert England and nobody else's name. Right? Or Patricia Arquette. Yeah, and well, part, yeah. Well, part, Patricia didn't want to come back. No, you know what not. I mean? Uh, and that's Poor Tuesday. You know? <laughs> like, she, like, if you ever see Never Sleep Again, Poor Tuesday. But, uh, she bitter? Yes, <laughs> she is. And I, she has every right to be, yeah, too. Absolutely. It's like if you have a film and where everybody's talking about you and you don't get to rebut them, and they're your peers and you work with them and they talk about how, what a loser you are. Yeah, I think she has a right to be pissed off. And I think the directors, and that's one of the things that I had about Nightmare on Elm Street. Right before this, I had worked with Robert Altman, Francois Truffaut, uh, Geraldine Page, right? A director's job is to protect actors, to let them be free. And so for the first time, what I was doing in Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was, for the very first time, I trusted people to let my guard down completely. And I was climbing Mount Everest, because I could play any freak that you wanted. A, a walk in nervous breakdown, not a problem for me. The Mount Everest for me, because of my self-esteem, was to play a normal all-American boy. And I wanted to see if I could do it. And I trusted these people to let me do it. Nobody ever told me that the scream didn't work, or the dance wasn't good, or I looked a little gay up there. And people say, what, what did you think the first time you saw yourself in this movie? And I used to have a really cute story, right? about how I was at MGM and the screen's really big, it was an IMAX, and I was just thrilled because my dream had come true and I was a movie star. But what I really thought was, my God, you look like a fag and everybody's gonna know. And that's the legacy right there. Because I'm in love with Connor Jessup right now on a movie called Closet Monster, which is 2015 Tiff. We did write an article on it last year as well. boy. <laughs> that boy came out on his 25th birthday. Yeah, he did. And he got tired of answering those questions and now he don't have to answer them no more. And still, that's the legacy. Do you still think it's difficult, though? I mean, and even like, I mean, it's different than it was in '85. But like, you know, like for Connor to come out even today, like get work in Hollywood. Well, it is because you know what the thing is is like, it's not the industry, it's not Netflix, it's not any of the, it's the people that are embedded in the industry, and generally they're homosexuals that are the roadblock right now. Mm -hmm. It's the managers, the agents, and the casting directors. And the casting directors say, oh, they don't want any gay people. But if you go to the head of the network. They'll say, we don't care who it is as long as you put them there. And there are thousands of gay actors who are out now, right? What's going to be the holistic moment? We used to think it would be like a cis male who like presented as straight and he would get to be the big movie star. And then big reveal, he's gay, right? It's not going to be it. It's going to be that boy who's really fabulous, that like Timothy Chalamet, that like we don't really care if he's gay or straight, whatever, he's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. and, the, and Lucas Haas, that's, those people are coming. They're here, they're in the pipeline, and one of them is going to break out and be a huge star. I wish it would have been Timothy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved him in Call Me By Your Name, but I wish they would have put a gay boy in that role. The, and also the same with... With uh, Army Hammer. And with the Army changes Hammer. Th that have come from the 80s, you know, are not only with the gay community, but also with African American, with women, with Hispanic. And, and being an actor, as long as I've been an actor, I've got to know so many other actors. And when you see firsthand the challenges that they've had. Women in the 80s had it, had it tough. They had it very tough. I had a lot, I had a lot of black buddies in, that were actors in the 80s, and they had it tough. And you know what? Those changes have been getting better and better, but more change needs to come. 
and, and you know, all-inclusive means all-inclusive, not just a percentage. And, you know, I think that's part of the legacy, too, is that absolutely this is, this is like the gay community's movie as far as horror movies. When people always say, did you guys know that this was gay, the gay subtext, you, you, you said it right. It was like right in the text. And I always answer like, hell yeah, I did, right? But it's, I do it in, in, in sort of joke, but the real truth of it is, is that's why it played out the way it played out. And, and you know, that's why I think that we have a lot to be proud of. I'd like to just say one thing, and I know we're closing up, but I would love, I would love to propose, and she's not here, but I would love to propose this as something for you to do, or somebody to do. I would like to have a conversation with Elizabeth Berkeley from Showgirls, because she had exactly the same experience that I had. You know, she went into that movie thinking she was going to be a big star, and they made a laughing stock of her, and then, the, and then it just piled on. Her agent fired her. She couldn't get a job. Yeah, she couldn't do anything, and she did what the director asked her to do. And she's still carrying that shit around with her day. And I would love to sit down and talk to her about what the two of us have in common and how we've healed from it. Because show, the Showgirls documentary yeah. comes from a different angle, yeah. and Scream Queen comes from a totally different angle. And when you meet the two in the middle, that's where you find the truth. So Elizabeth, I'm here for you, darling. <laughs> Netflix, make it happen. Well, I, I know it's not, I, I, but like, because Verhoeven came out in like 2014 in an interview and finally said, I did that. And right. it's like, where, where were you the other 19 years right. when yeah, this he happened? Yeah, he hung around to drive. He got Starship Troopers right after Showgirls, which was like a $70 million budget in 1997. Right. After Showgirls bombed. Right. But she was sitting on the corner trying to sell her goods because, you know, like sell her, the things in her house. Because people made a joke of her. You know what I mean? And what the director was responsible for, that's what he did. And he's a crazy motherfucker and not very nice man. Oh, no, but he's terrible. Yeah, he's terrible he, to women. He did that to her. David did to me what was done to me. He did it intentionally. They punked her for 25 years. They punked me for 25 years, and we finally got the courage to stand up and say, no more. And that's the legacy of Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, and Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And that seems like a great place to end. I think, so, on that note, I think we can cross out A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Yes, and we can cross out Horror Queers Podcast. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Losers, this is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all. Would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.